<sighs> Morning, guidance. I literally muted it like a second ago to blow my nose and then I didn't unmute it. Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you guys find it annoying that I will have like, like I like do the streams one after another like this, but just like, can you hear me now? You can hear me now, right? Because um, just for like in the future when someone comes on my channel, if it's like a one long, super long video where I have like readings and analysis all in one video, it's like more inaccessible, I think. Um, as you can hear, uh, Lisa Michelle, thank you so, um, thank you so much for being here, Lisa. I'm very flattered. Um, okay, so I liked the essay. I don't know what you guys thought. There was nothing in it that I was like, "Whoa, what is that?" Um, um. Oh, what I found so interesting was the end of the introduction. Listen to this. Um, here, where is it? The occasional use of the plural pronoun they, them, and their are singular as singular pronouns where a singular and gender neutral pronoun is needed is also deliberate and should be chalked up to my politics, not to any weakness of my own or my editor's or proofreader's grasps of, standards gram of standard grammar. The usage of they, them, and their as singular pronouns is very common in spoken English, and I view it as harmless in the written language. Like, wow. Um, like, wow. Just, I don't have, like, any, like, issue with her. It's just, like, to say that and then, like, where we are now is pretty amazing, right? Especially because, according to the introduction and preface, um, which essay is that from? That's from the, um, the introduction. Um... Like, the preface and introduction, she makes it clear that, like, language is important to you, to her. She even explains why, like, what language will be in italics, what language will be in quotes. Um, oh, no, when is it from? Okay, so she said that the, a lot of the, what did she say here? Which, which essay was it? She said that she, here, give me a second here. I think that she said that these essays had been like conceptualized of in the mid seventies. Yeah, I would say in the seventies. This book was published in 1980... 1983. But she said that um like she taught um a philosophy a feminist philosophy course at um Michigan State University. <laughs> For many years and that this is kind of like the distillation of a lot of what she taught or kind of like i don't know how she phrased it exactly but like what she got from being challenged by the women she came in contact with and her students and stuff um so that's really cool it'd be kind of like if um well i mean mary daly basically did that didn't she with her books um and her courses um <laughs> mary um says oh i'm not on stream yard um says glad you're reading this i tried but have no attention span for books yeah i'm very very good at reading fiction like i can sit down for 12 hours and read a fiction novel but i'm very bad at reading nonfiction. so what i found is that doing it this way when i'm telling myself that i'm doing it for other people because i'm trying to make it accessible it makes it very easy for me to do it for myself um so you've caught me all of this is just a con to convince myself to read more nonfiction. <laughs> okay I'm sorry. So, um, um, a bird killed me. Says I came in a bit late. 
are you talking about oppression of women as women? Yes, that is what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> so she's very materialist so far. Um, I also found it interesting at one point, um, <clears throat> I think it was in the introduction. Yeah, in the introduction that she said, you know, the entire point of these essays is for women to understand the, like, the complete structure of what is oppressing them, that everything is interconnected and dependent on each other, right? And um, <clears throat> that what may like be the like the clue that gets you to understand that might be an anecdotal experience from one woman, and that that might be just as impactful for you as seeing like statistical data about something that happens to women, and that she just wants women to like have a deeper understanding of their situation in society, their position in society. Um, yeah, it's like compared to a lot of the co modern queer theory bullshit, it's just like so refreshing to be like, I'm speaking to you. Um, also, though, one of my criti very few criticisms of what I've read is that she does like he slash she. And I'm kind of like, why? Aren't you a separatist? Just write to women. <laughs> but like, it's OK. Um, so towards the end, instead of saying he slash she, I just started saying she. <laughs> um, Clown World says, OMG, right? Totally different context nowadays. But it's more efficient than writing out his or hers, etc. over and over. Yeah, exactly. Like, I would prefer to read they than his slash her. Because it's also kind of hard to pronounce it, especially when you speak fast like me. <laughs> um, how are you feeling? I'm actually fine. What it is is that I have asthma. And when I wake up in the mornings, I'm like a little bit congested. And literally what happened is that in my mind, this didn't start until 11. And so I got out of bed at like 10.06. And I looked at my phone and people were like, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> so usually I would like have a shower or like a cup of coffee or something to like decongest my nose before I start getting on YouTube but it was too late for that today um <clears throat> yeah no I'm fine I just have asthma Um, and also, as usual, if you hear cello, there's like a cello lesson happening downstairs. Okay. Um, Mary says, I hope you're eating more animal foods. Do you mean like meat or the food that animals eat, like non-meat? Um, Clown World says, I devour books when I was a kid. I ought to get back into that habit. It's actually so hard. Like when I was a teenager, I was like ravenous for books, like ravenous, like reading over 100 books a year, you know, but like. Then when I got into university and you have to like read textbooks and like do assignments and everything, it was like my energy level for reading was like gone. Um, and also like I think I became my relationship with social media changed and my relationship with social media kind of like took the energy and brain power that I would need for reading, I think. And so in the last in the last year, like starting in about October it's not even a year in the last like six months I think I have read like 200 novels and a big part of the way I did that was to like consciously whenever I want to like open some social media like stop myself and be like what are you doing how much time are you going to spend doing that don't you want to read your book um also audiobooks if you have trouble um uh, audiobooks like I really recommend um <clears throat> that's kind of why I'm doing this because like if you want you can download the videos or the audio and just listen to me reading if you want um Okay. Lisa Michelle says, not everything needs to be a study. Anecdotes are important in consciousness raising. Yeah, exactly. Um, I really think of that um, in terms of um, women with just gender dysphoria or with gender issues or women who are transitioning or detransitioning or whatever that like, or not transitioning, but detransitioning. Like when it comes to like accepting yourself and like, feeling solidarity with other women and like learning to love yourself and stuff like that I really think like this is like like necessary um very important yeah um a bird killed me says Holly Lawford Smith talks about this as well when being oppressed as women she said which I thought was cool that in feminist circles when choosing what issues to tackle it is a good idea to think about whether or not men are oppressed for the same issues if the answer is yes it isn't up to feminism to deal with the issue, but another type of movement. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, I want to eventually read Holly Lawford Smith's um, stuff, but I was like, I told you guys before, people are like, why aren't you reading like more lesbian stuff or like more? And I'm like, I'm, I have decided that these are like my fundamental beginner rad femme literature. 
then I will move on to like more challenging or specific stuff like womenist stuff or like lesbian separatist stuff right and then I will do like more modern stuff like I want to have like a really solid understanding of like the fundamental feminist theory before I go into like the modern stuff um okay Lisa says read what you want well I'm reading what I have so after this book I'm pretty sure we're gonna read this it's like an autobiography slash like, it's one of those, like, semi-fiction, non-fiction books. But every single lesbian I know who's read this is, like, this is, like, a, a playbook of how-to grassroots and also, like, lesbian history. So, like, it sounds like a fucking great book. Um, I also might be able to interview the author on my channel. I do have contact with her. Not very much, but some. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the essay. And then, honestly, I don't have, like, a huge amount of criticism. Uh, maybe I need to find a way to talk about stuff more in terms of how I agree with it than when I disagree with it. Um, and, like, honestly, if we do this for, like, half an hour, then I can start the next chapter. I don't know what you guys are doing today, but um, I have a Zoom at 2, and it's 11.25. So, other than that, I'm good. Um, probably should do the dishes or laundry or something, but whatever. <clears throat> Oh, I need to buy cat litter from Momo. Momo! Do any of you guys use, like, those disposable cat litters? I had the one that you can, like, flush. It's, like, kind of, like, sawdust for a while. But it does, like, nothing for the smell. Like, it's pretty bad. So I went back to, like, the old clay litter. But I kind of feel, like, bad about throwing in the garbage all the time. Like, my roommates, for their cat, they have, like... It's, like, this, like these paper pellets or something. But you can also scoop it and flush it. I don't know. Like, today I'm going to clean out the entire litter box, like, with soap and water and, like, put new litter. Um, <laughs> Clown World says, I'm a vegan and my brain is fine, Mary. <laughs> oh, my God. I actually, my ex, I was, like, a vegetarian when I met, you know, I used to be a vegan. And I was a vegetarian when I met my ex. Because um, I started eating fish and cheese again. Um, I fucking love sushi so much. Like, it was, like, really difficult to not eat sushi when I was a vegan. <laughs> but... She was, like, obsessed with this concept that I was, like, rotting my brain. And I was, like, I take, like, omega acids and, like, B12 and shit and iron. Like, I'm not stupid. And she was just, like, no, you're going to die. Like, you need to eat meat. And so now I'm not a vegetarian anymore. <laughs> I need to um un re vegetarianize my – or not even, pescatarian. I'd be happy. With. I also need to stop eating gluten. I just have no no self-control whatsoever. Um, I really need to stop eating gluten. And I would like to stop eating, like, at least red meat. I don't know. But, like, ribs, guys. Ribs. Like, how am I supposed to... What am I supposed to do in the face of that? You know? Anyway. You can do vegan sushi. True. But I hate seaweed. <laughs> I only like, like, sushi sushi. I don't like, um... I don't like, um, maki. Oh, Komutashi is here. Um, Inari wrappers are amazing little tofu friends. Oh. Interesting. Okay. So... I make saitan ribs. Oh, interesting. Hey, Alka Marina. So I have to obviously come visit you now so you can make me vegan sushi. Um, okay. Which, by the way, I'm definitely going to come to your province this summer. No question. I actually might be road tripping all the way out to Vancouver, in which case I'm going to stop in like every fucking major city and meet up with the turfs. Inari is good when it's really sweet. Um, <clears throat> okay. So. Maybe what's interesting is to go through and, um... <laughs> oh, Karina, I'm definitely going to come visit you. You seem quite adamant about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think maybe it would be interesting to go through and look at her um, metaphors or anecdotes or whatever. So, I actually felt like, I don't know if this makes me arrogant, <clears throat> but when the way that she would, like, demonstrate things, I'm like, oh my god, I do that. Like, no, obviously not in the same philosophical way. BRB now, I'm hungry, says Lisa. <laughs> um... Clown World says my favorite food was filet mignon. I was a huge eat meat eater, uh, meat eater, but it has been a long, so long. I don't miss um, meat and dairy anymore. Yeah, I mean honestly, um, <clears throat> I don't know. I grew up like I would do like all you can eat ribs with my dad. We'd go to like rib fest together, um, and like f for Canadians, you know, like Tim's, they have like the chili in like the bread bowl, or they used to have the chili in the bread bowl. It was so good. I just have like oh, and my dad's family, like Mennonites. Um, and farmers. So every time you go there, there's like 
big amounts of like really fatty meat all the time, which actually is pretty gross. But um, I just feel like it was like such a huge thing. And then when I eventually did go vegetarian, it was like for the same reason that I eventually stopped drinking Coke was because like I gorged myself on so much of it that it became like like nauseating to even contemplate eating it. So what happened was, I don't know if you guys need my whole life story, but here it goes. I moved to university, right? And like most shitty universities, it was like you have to have a meal card if you live in res and you have to eat the food in like the dorm hall. Like, like so you fill up your card with money, so you have to spend the money there or else you basically threw it away. And so like every single fucking day, I would have like two or three double cheeseburgers and like tons of Coke. And I just like gained so much weight and I was like unwell. <laughs> And I was like, I need to stop. Um, oh, Clown World has to actually work. Well, that sucks. But hopefully you can listen. Um, I love to spoil you, rad fan babe. <laughs> Says Aquarina. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. So. If we are found insensitive, we may fear we have no redeeming traits at all and perhaps are not real women thus we are silenced before we begin the name of our situation drained of meaning and our guilt mechanisms tripped this to me is very relevant to how um a lot of the gender critical women treat the um quote-unquote gender critical tims like the having empathy for others outside their group is like a cornerstone of like if you think about like female socialization right it's like so ingrained in us that like is there a random child who's hurt it's your responsibility to do something about it is there a man who's sad it's your responsibility to do something about it it's like whenever there's someone who's not you who needs help it's like you are conditioned and required and expected to like have sympathy and help them and it's like when you're doing that for men, you're wasting your fucking energy. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay. Um, I mean, like, at least in, within the feminist movement, obviously. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, like, if you have a son, like, obviously fucking take care of your son. Okay. Um, She says, um, but this is nonsense. Human beings can be miserable without being oppressed. Yeah. I also love how much of the essay she devoted to differentiating between what is and isn't oppression. Because men are so manipulative at this. Like, we, we've we really seen it in this decade. A lot of these men being like, you know, I can't cry. Or like, are my feelings? And like, oh, you know, it's expected for me to be tough. And like, all this crap. I mean, okay, I don't know if it's like especially bad now compared to before. But like, um... I just feel like with liberal feminism and all of that crap now, because like people can claim so many identities that make them oppressed, you know, you will have so many women catering to these men. And it's like, what did the, why is the man oppressed? Basically for nothing. Well, the woman who is actually oppressed is over here holding his hand and shit. Um, <clears throat> and I find it very, very manipulative. And I think that we really need to be aware of, like, what is and is not oppression. Yeah, like, I very agree with, like, most of the fucking essay. Um, we need this word, this concept, and we need it to be sharp and sure. So, the word, obviously, is not sharp and sure now. The word oppression. The word oppression now is, like, ubiquitous and means almost nothing in, like, average parlance, um, unfortunately. Um... A bird killed me, says patriarchy hurts men too. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, maybe, but okay, this is, um, Lisa says they can't cry when they feel bad for raping us. Exactly, sister. Like, if they can't have empathy for us, why are we expected? Like, they are actively oppressing us. And it's our, like, job to comfort them for feeling like, you know, having to handle oppressing us or like the work of oppressing us or like whatever it's literally like imagine like a slave situation okay and you are a slave and this is your master and your master is like oh carrying the chain is really heavy like can you rub my arm for me 
and like oh my god it's so much work that i had to like you know get this paperwork to say that i own you like it's oh can you like rub my hand that i had to sign this paper like it's that level of insanity it's literally that level of insanity it's like are you serious right now it's like absurd okay <clears throat> um no because okay lisa's like carrying the chain is heavy lol no because literally um i was like i think i was on this must have been on twitter i think i was on twitter with the sock account a couple months ago and i ran into these mena dudes you know like the um like islamic hardcore dudes from like um northern africa and stuff <clears throat> the middle east and they literally were saying like these these men from like saudi like countries where women can't have bank accounts or property and stuff they were like you know, like, it's so much responsibility for the men when we're the only breadwinners and the only one who can do X and Y. Like, it's so much work for us. And, like, we should be appreciated. I am, like, you're complaining about a problem you fucking solved. You don't want to have responsibility. Give women independence to take care of themselves and then you won't have to take care of them. You fucking caused the problem. Don't complain to me about it. It's fucking bullshit. Um, Lisa says if they hate it so much, they can undo it. Exactly. Lisa says, oh, my God, American men say that too. Yeah, it's this whole, like, chivalrous bullshit um you know like that like i for some reason i can feel i can it's more obvious to me in southern women in like their mannerisms towards their men um like in the u.s like southern american women but it's yeah it's very obvious that it's like the men are chivalrous and like they're nice to you so you like owe them it's like this like this like i don't know very like disturbing yeah <laughs> Lisa Michelle says being the breadwinner is so hard. Yeah. And it's like, also when men complain about that shit, I'm like, how many fucking, how many of you have mothered children and then fucked off? I mean, fathered children and then fucked off. You think it's not hard for that woman? Like, because you have a dick, your feelings are really important. Like, seriously, fuck off with that. Clown World says, reminds me of when I had a conversation with my ex friend about how prostituted women don't genuinely want to have sex with their customers. And he felt bad. He was a John. So then I comforted him. I wish I could go back in time and tell him to to, to unalive himself. Yeah. Um, I know um, a radical-esque woman uh, who reads a lot of literature. So when I'm in her area, I like to drop in and just talk with her about what she's reading. Um, she told me a story where her male friend basically attempted to sexually assault her. And then the man felt bad about it after because he was like, I ruined our friendship or whatever. And the result of her being, of, of him attempting to sexually assault her was her comforting him. And they're still friends. Um, and it's like really this like, this conditioning of self-sacrifice of like, none of my feelings or my wants or my desires or my needs matter. All that matters is like the feelings and wants of the desires of the people around me. I need to constantly be serving the people around me. And it's like, no, sometimes you need to like fucking take care of yourself prioritize yourself you matter more than anyone with a penis <laughs> that is my opinion <laughs> okay um anung says yeah it takes a lot of energy to be constantly holding your boot on a woman's neck oh <laughs> um pinwheel art says i don't relate to southerners yeah what's your flag though is that the texas no that's not texas is that mississippi what is the flag that's in your pinwheel art thing I know like the US states where they are, but I don't know the um the um the flags. Okay. Well, Texas is like how not to know. Everybody in Texas acts like it's their own fucking country. Okay. Um Lavender Rose says, There is not a violence small enough to express my sympathy for these guys, quote unquote responsibility. It's just male privilege. Yeah. Um a a bird killed me says, Women belong in the kitchen. Oh my god, it's so hard having to earn money for the family. And then crying emojis. Yeah. Exactly, Anung. This is very concise. Anung says, time spent comforting the oppressor is time wasted. You never get that back. Oh, you like it when I read, when I read your, when I laugh, when I read your comments. Oh, Puerto Rico. Fuck, how did I mess that up? I've been to Puerto Rico. <laughs> You're in South Carolina. Okay. Um, um, <clears throat> Anung says, Andrea Dworkin said that she thought men really wanted to have an image of women suffering on the cross. Hmm. Because if we are, like, these, like, men, I don't understand, like, well, I understand it. It's because they're, like, moronic. <laughs> but 
men will be like, oh, women, you're always like victimizing and like have like a victim complex and you're always talking about like all these bad things and complaining. And blah, blah, blah. But men like that because then it plays into their whole chivalrous white knight bullshit, right? If the women weren't like needing help and like suffering and being victims, then the men couldn't swoop in and be like a savior and be like, okay, I saved you now. Like um, in this chapter, in the essay, she talks about um, men opening the door. And to me, what that is, is, um, oh, fuck, what is the word for that? Okay, someone who knows about like psychology and abuse dynamics, please tell me what is the word for the thing I'm describing. It's like when you do something nice for someone in order to guilt them that you, that they owe you something now. Um, it's like manipulative and it's like when men do this like the door opening thing like it's so like like ubiquitous and like 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 such a minor detail in, in your life right it has nothing like no effect on you really in most ways but it's like even in this small act she makes it clear like the man is doing this because it's like he wants to see like he's like a badass and like he's he's like strong and like doing nice things for you um and it's like what is the woman's response supposed to be this is conditioning the woman men are helpful men are nice men do nice things for you so you should do nice things for the men and it's like how about let the women fucking live her life by herself and get the men to fuck off the men to fuck off um anang says he used to call it tit for tat yeah um um a bird killed me says the concept of giving a gift freely doesn't exist for men mm -hmm. pumil art says they want mary up there but what is more suffering her on the cross or seeing her son suffer mm -hmm. anung says they sexualize women's suffering yeah it's like dorkin said any suffering for a woman is pornography for a man yeah okay let's keep moving on a bit here so i thought this was interesting i'm going to just repeat this Lisa says everything is transactional with men. Exactly. That's what I mean when I see like with Southern women and their relationship with men. I mean, it somehow is just more obvious to me because of like their mannerism and language. But it really does seem like very transactional to me. Um, Lisa says the women who push the quote unquote good one stuff need to realize, yeah, that men just want shit from us. Yeah. So here, um, this is in the first section of the essay it says the root of the word oppression is the element press the press of the crowd pressed into military service to press a pair of pants printing press press the button presses are used to mold things or flatten them or reduce them in bulk sometimes to reduce them by squeezing out the gases or liquids in them sometimes pressed into something caught between or among forces or and barriers which are so related to each other that jointly they, res they restrain restrict and prevent the thing's motion or mobility mold, immobilize, reduce. So I think this is like a very, um, I don't know, like impactful way of, of having an awareness of oppression. Um, I've never really thought of it this way before. And like, of course it makes sense. Um, but if you really think about it, it's like, like, yeah, um, the way you walk, the way you talk, what your interests are supposed to be, all of these things are like restrictive, repressive, and it's not one thing that's restricting or oppressing you. It's like the relationship between multiple things that are restricting and oppressing you. Um, yeah, I just, I found that like very um, poignant. Um, Clarmold says the bar is hilariously low for quote unquote good men. You don't beat your wife. Wow. <laughs> Lisa says men don't do things out of the goodness of their heart. Yeah. Okay. Then she talks a bit about the Madonna whore complex. Um, also, I found it interesting. I think it's because it's a product of her time and her politics, perhaps. I found this quite interesting. Um, she says... Um, well, where's the beginning of this phrase? Jesus, this phrase is long. Okay. Women are, but like, listen to the word lesbian and heterosexual in this context and how she uses them. I found it interesting. Women are caught like this too by networks of forces and barriers that expose one to penalty, loss, or contempt, whether one works outside the home or not, is on welfare or not, bears children or not, raises children or not, marries or not, stays married or not, is heterosexual, lesbian, both, or neither. So I think that. Well, based on um, having read sophistries before this, I think that there really 
is a definition or a usage of the word lesbian that just means an interest in women that is not exclusive. Um, and I find that very interesting. Um, obviously, my first reaction to using the word lesbian as a non-exclusive interest, sexual interest in women, is like gets my hackles up. It's like offensive. But, you know, this is how she uses the word in this time period. And like, we're going to fucking read the book. So it's interesting. Um, yes. Yeah. And so how this, this like women are caught between a rock and a hard place. Like either you sexually commodify yourself and you're like a slut or you don't and something is wrong with you. It's like no matter what you do you're screwed. I think this can be said in a lot of ways for women. Like, you know, whether you start a family or not, whether you go into, like, a career or not, these kind of things, like, when it comes to, like, well, the career, it's kind of, I meant that kind of in the context of you're married to a man. But, like, a lot of these things are, it's like, you're kind of screwed both ways, whether you do it or not. Um, Anung says, women identified women and living with a quote-unquote lesbian consciousness used to be in the thing in the 80s. Yeah. I knew Marilyn. What the fuck? Dude, where? How? Can I interview you? <laughs> um, I assume she's passed away based on the years of this book, but she might not necessarily have been. Um... But yeah, so I, that's what I mean. It's like a product of the era. So we need to like take that into consideration and not be immediately like offended by it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a bird killed me says, I fucking hate those videos where a man use a vacuum cleaner or fix the kid's hair and the woman in the comments are like, oh my God, husband goals. Yeah. Like it's with comments like that, that you know, that women know that it's not supposed to be a partnership. The fact that a woman thinking a man doing like some small things to help out with like housekeeping or child rearing if they think that some small thing to help out with housekeeping or child rearing is a big deal then all of these women are telling you they don't expect their men to be in a partnership with them and to contribute equally right like i was having a discussion with a friend of mine yesterday night about um why i'm critical of marriage and she kept saying like but things are different now and i'm like okay things are different now right because women are not getting married when they're 20 and staying in their marriages forever like in north america at least like if i'm thinking about canada really that's true. The pattern is different. But within the relationship, so you might have shorter, more relationships and for them to be shorter. That seems to be the general trend with women these days. They're not staying in one long-term relationship as much. But what happens within the relationship, to me, that is the problem and that's the same. So whether you're getting it from one man for a long time or a couple different men for shorter amounts of time, that is still the problem. That is still them sapping the energy and resources out of you for their own gain in like to your detriment. Um, okay. Um, Clown World says, hell, the description of quote unquote lesbian used to be so broad. Some second waivers use it to talk about basically any woman aligned woman regardless of sexual attraction. Yeah. What? Anung says, no, she's alive. I worked at her women's bookstore, took her class even, partied with her. I was close with her lover. She was shy. Dude. Dude. Can I meet her? Can I interview her? What? Where is this? In America somewhere. In Michigan? Because you said you're in... Um, oh my god, my brain. Lake Erie. So you're in Michigan too, right? Well, Michigan is, like, very close for me. I actually was going to go to some, like, women's stuff in Michigan this summer. But then, like, the U.S.-Canada border COVID situation was, like, bullshit. Um, hello, Hugo. Um, <clears throat> I am very willing. She lives in East Lansing. Oh, my God. That's so close. Um, and, like, Lansing is where the... Um, oh, no. Is that Ann Arbor? Where Lesbian Connections is printed. Um, that is so close. I really hope that this summer I can, like, actually go. I went back to the bush. I want an island in the middle of Lake Superior. My mom grew up in the bush. It's really funny. Like, I people who are, like, from big cities, when you're like, yeah, I'm from the bush, they're like, what does that mean? <laughs> but she's always like, yeah, I'm going to go visit my grandmother in the bush. And people are like, what? <laughs> um, I don't know that she would give an interview. She's not an extrovert. Okay, well, that's fine. But I just mean, like, 
it's it's really exciting to me like you know so much time has passed and she had this opinion then and she's witnessed all this like what must she think about it you know um Lisa Michelle says, lol, high value man equals can cook spaghetti. Yeah, like you put pasta in a pot with water. F fucking amazing. <laughs> um, I saw Marilyn at a friend's funeral in 2005. She still tried to bring back Mishfest. Oh my god, have I met her? Because I went to like one of those like alt Mishfests in 2017. Um, and I met a bunch of the women and hung out with them and stuff. Like, I would love, to, there's like, you know, the women's land in Michigan. I would love to go to one of the workshops this summer, if it's possible. Anang says, I'm sure Marilyn thinks the same way she always has strong lesbian separatists. Yeah, no, exactly. But, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Kumitashi says, there's a TV commercial that says, love it when dad cooks. Hashtag high value men. Oh, Anang says you should be able to contact her through the We Want the Land Coalition website. Um, interesting. Okay, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, okay, let's keep going through the essay a bit. <clears throat> I wonder what she would think of me like reading this. I'm sure that there's stuff later on that I'm going to disagree with. But um, like, okay, so one time I went to this like festival and I was playing unaccompanied Bach when I was 15 and it was in Minneapolis. Like I flew to Minneapolis by myself to play this Bach on my viola. And I was playing it like and the guy who edited that edition of the Bach was there and I had changed a bunch of like the bowings and like phrasing and stuff and he was like incensed he was like I edited this to be a specific way and you're playing it this other way and I was like well you know like baroque standards and like blah 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 like harmonies things and he was like I don't know he was like really angry about it and so I wonder if and if I ever meet any of the feminists whose books I'm reading, if they'll be like, <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, um, Dewey says, my Caribbean mom says the bush quite often. Americans never seem to understand the term. Mm. I think it depends where you are. Anang says, I think Marilyn would love you. Oh my God. Okay. Um, you would have loved Marilyn's course at MSU. You would have gotten A. Oh my god. Do you know? Okay. So, okay, when I was a teenager, I hung out with all of these queer theory types in Toronto, right? I actually used to, I was, I skipped school so much. I was so horrible with school. Like, I would go with school to give you a book and go home and read the book. And you have to show up in class and write an essay. I can do that. But, like, doing assignments and stuff, like, I was so, like, mentally unwell. Like, I couldn't, like, regulate any part of my life. So what I would do is I would, my mom, I would go to school like on the subway in the morning and then I would immediately leave. <laughs> and I had friends who were at like Ryerson and U of T and stuff and they'd be like, oh, like this author is coming in because they just launched this new book and he's going to like tell us about it. And I would just like sneak into their lecture hall and listen to it when I was like in high school. Um, or like, <laughs> like Julia Sereno, I went to like his book readings um, because like, at the at the queer bookstore in Toronto. Like they would it, there's very few queer bookstores in the world right so when like a queer writer publishes something they end up going to like the handful of queer bookstores that exist and like doing a tour right so i'll go to that anyway my point is that i thought i was like very academically minded and i hung out with all these people who went to U of T and stuff and they were doing the sexual diversity studies which is kind of like that's what women's studies has been replaced with and they were all like you will find this boring because you have read all these books already and i was like okay then i became a rad femme like the year before I was going to go to university is when I like peaked and became a rad femme. And well, rad femme ish, pretty light back then, very nice femme back then. But, um, uh, and then I was like, oh my God, I want to study like real feminism in university. Maybe I can do like a double major. Like, oh, which university has like good. And I remember talking, there was actually this Tim who taught women's studies at UBC, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. I don't remember her name. It was like Aoife, but like, it was like E, it was like the the Celtic way of spelling. It was like E-O-F-F-I-E-A or something like that. Anyway, whatever. So there's Tim and he, I don't remember why it was like in his orbit, but he was on Twitter criticizing liberal feminism, I think. And he taught women's studies. And I remember asking him like, which university in Canada do you think has radical feminist professors at it? It was like, is there any university that you never hear anything positive liberal feminist stuff coming out of those universities? Are there any professors that there has been like some kind of a scandal because they're too like separatist or something? And this Tim literally was like, 
you know, I've been teaching women's studies in Canada for like quite a while. And I can't think I can't recommend a professor or a university to you specifically if what you want to study is second wave feminism and not be like have all this postmodernism stuff down your throat. And then when I was at university, um, I went to like a very small university, like the student population was like 3,500 or something of the whole university. And um, um, when I, I don't know, I was at like a recital or a concert or something. And I, I ran into this person who's like with their friend who was there. And the friend was like, oh, I'm studying women's studies. And I was like, oh, this is the first person I've met at university who's studying women's studies. I would, I can't wait to have like a conversation with her. And I, my thought was, you know, she's probably a lib femme. But I want to hear, like, why does she believe what she believes? What are they reading? Like, what are they talking about? And I thought this is going to be, like, an interesting conversation. And I introduced myself to her and I said, oh, like, you're in, you're in women's studies. And she's like, yeah. And I was like, oh, like, I'm a feminist, but I'm, like, a second wave feminist. And she literally said to me, as a third year women's studies degree, she said to me, what does that mean? What? That's like saying, like, I, I'm, I'm a history major. I don't know what the Roman Empire is. That That is the level of what anyway um and i that that was the moment that i was like i made a good decision by not going into any women's studies courses at all um i'm actually part of like um there's a woman doing her phd in canada who has like um like a virtual like kind of feminist school it's not the same as like jane claire jones's like real feminist school it's more like a book club that like once a month you read a couple of essays or listen to a pop podcast and you um talk and i think i really like that because it's a non-academic setting the women are not there because they're trying to get a mark they're not there because they're trying to pass a class they're there because like they have real world experience that has led them to radical feminism because they're like you know what i mean it's just like more of an authentic um interest in it and that is like so fucking important to me um it's very comparable to like if you're in a quartet and everybody really likes the music but one person is like just going through the motions to get the mark and it fucking destroys the whole piece of music yeah it's like that to me um although i would at some point like to take a women's studies course like when i'm older when i'm like retired I would love to take like women's studies courses and just stand up and be as turfy as possible and like let these kids know that there's a way like there's another way <laughs> you don't have to like w worship at the altar of gender okay um I don't know if you guys needed to hear a whole like rambling about that but a bird killed me says y'all remember when Gillette had that commercial about men doing better and men got angry and the hashtag not all men was trending men can do better not all men yeah like what a self own to be honest <laughs> Like, again, you're literally telling us, like, no, I like it when my bros get to rape women and they face no accountability. That's what you're telling us. And then you're we're supposed to think you're good guys for having that position. Like, the level of absurdity. It's like, I must have done a lot of drugs because how did we end up here? It doesn't make any... Like, I fell through the, through the looking glass or whatever. Like, nothing makes sense. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Okay. Um... A bird killed me says my dad's cooking is terrible. Actually, my dad is the one who taught me to cook. My dad, he does like all the women's work. Like he's good at it. And he taught me how to do it. He's a really good baker, actually. He makes like a lot of cool um food, um, like cook cakes and shit like that. Anung says, There are no Tims back then. One guy tried to join and disrupt Marilyn's course. She annihilated him. I would love to fucking talk about that with her. Um, you know what else I've been thinking about? I have met some radical feminists who don't swear because they consider swearing to be like a kind of um a manifestation of like male aggression in society or something along those lines and that you're like using men's language and contributing to like men's culture by swearing and i'm like a very sweary person you might have noticed um and i wonder like is there something i can read to learn more about that um um, Aquamina says, um, Benji, have you ever seen Derek Jensen's Queer 3 Jeopardy YouTube videos? So many women have recommended Derek Jensen to me. And then I will, like, download a YouTube video or a podcast or something. And then, you know, like, by the time I actually get in the car to drive somewhere or I have time, I'm always like, ooh, I want to listen to this audio. I don't know. I just, I never really get around to Derek Jensen. Is he that spectacular, though? Like, Derek Jensen is Andrea Dworkin's husband, right? Wasn't he, like, didn't he try and, like, historically revisionism some of her stuff to like sanitize it to say that she wasn't that turfy or something um i'll watch the queer three jeopardy video it's like six minutes says lisa michelle okay i'll watch it unless i'm confusing him with someone else but wasn't there someone who like 
Because Derek Jensen is Deep Green Resistance, right? Wasn't the Deep Green Resistance guy like trying to sanitize some of Dworkin's work posthumously or something like that? Um, Anung says college ain't what it used to be. It's about teaching you to conform to an academic attitude now, not about expanding your mind or teaching you how to think. Yeah, I found it very, very frustrating. Um, like, I I was so excited to get to university. I thought it would be so different than you than high school. And everybody there, it's just like blindly going through the motions and you like ask them why they think something or why they did something. And they're like, oh, well, that's what I have to do to get the mark. And I'm like, is this really like, this is how your child, like, I don't know. It was really disappointing to me. Um, Hugo says this channel is my feminist school. Well, I'm glad to, um, hopefully, you know, if we keep reading books, like if we get through like a book a week, there'll be like dozens of books on my channel soon. So it should be pretty, a pretty huge resource, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. Yogi says, my husband works, cooks, cleans, sews, builds things, volunteers, and rescues to protect women in domestic violence situations. He is very, very rare. I'm well aware. That should be the that should be the bare minimum for being a decent man. All of those things. Like, actively helping women to get the fuck away from abusive men should be the bare minimum for a decent guy. <laughs> Not that I think there is, like, a huge usefulness in labeling guys as good guys right anyway um <clears throat> yogi says hopefully feminism will actually be for women again before you are old well even if it's when i'm old i would love to contribute to that being an eventuality um <clears throat> lisa says i don't swear but i don't have a reason why is it i remember in one of your videos you said like this is the kind of like my videos are supposed to be something you can show to your grandparents or something like they're supposed to be like like accessible in that way um i thought that was really cute and i liked that <laughs> um lisa says worshiping at the altar of gender is worshiping at the altar of men yes exactly Anong says, swearing used to be considered patriarchal. I tried not to swear, but I just couldn't fucking do it. Alex Dobkin talked about it a lot. I don't know if her writings survived. I want to read Alex Dobkin eventually. Like, it's all my long list of things that I want to read. What I'm reading now is just things that I have. And then once I'm done reading the things that I have, I will buy more. Or you guys can buy me. I really need to get on top of that. I have, like, an Amazon wish list. But like I've said before, I'm, like, conflicted about, you know, because Amazon. But how else are you supposed to buy me books and send them to me? Actually, I guess you could PayPal me like 20 bucks and be like, I want you to spend it on this book um, and then I can order it myself. Um, I would love to foster a relationship with a women's bookstore, you know, like to constantly order from them. Um, but there is not really women's bookstores in Canada. Um, and like there's one that opened like a queer women's bookstore that opened in Montreal, I think two years ago. But I remember looking through their catalog online and it's like completely... Um, completely um queer theory like they have like a lesbian history section and there's not one single book on barbara giddings there's not one single book about um the daughter's abilities or the lavender menace so i'm like what oh my god and there's a gay club in montreal now called lavender menace and it's like a queer people's club I'm like how fucking offensive to appropriate a political moment in like lesbian and women's history as like a cool queer thing like no lavender menace was like ugh, i don't know hugo says i pirate my books no i know but what i am trying to do is i'm trying to get these books that are like that have very little demand for them so that when they go out of print or if they're already out of print especially there's a couple of books that are out of print that i really want that are like 100 bucks because they're like hard to get your hands on but um I want to, like, have, like, a real physical library of women's books that I can, like, lend to women. And then in, like, 50 years when these books are even harder to get your hands on, I have them. You know what I'm thinking? You know what I'm saying? Lisa says, I think it's important for women to be aggressive and angry, but context is also important. Yeah. Context and I think also the effect it has on you. I, I have been in this situation where, like, you know, like, feminist anger is justified, obviously. But there is a certain point and, like... If you're in that state and I'm saying this to you, you're going to be like, you don't know what you're saying, Benji. But like, actually, I kind of do know what I'm saying, where like anger can be like all consuming in a negative way and hurt you. And I have been in that space, like um, both with like family stuff and with feminism stuff. And I think anger is like really powerful and really important. And but we just need to be like aware of how we're directing it and how it's affecting us. Um, 
That's all I'm trying to say. Lisa says, I feel like being shamed for being nice is also tone policing. And I've had quote unquote nice femmes used to shame me, which is garbage. Yeah. Um, like I say on this channel a lot, like we should all be able to disagree. Like, you know, there's straight women here, married women here. Like, all right. Um, or there's also quite a few women who listen to me who I don't think like would call themselves radical feminists. They're just kind of gender critical or something. Um, and I want, I think you all should be able to access um, my opinions and the books that I'm reading and like come to your own conclusions about it and like disagree civilly. Um, I really, really believe that. Like how are women supposed to um, consciousness raise and, and, and move further into their analysis if we don't create that space for them, right? Um, it'd be pretty hypocritical of feminists to not create this space for women to um, evolve in their feminism and then say, like, why aren't there more radical feminists? Anyway. Um, Rick Hillary says, do you find it difficult to express anger? Um, do y'all? So I guess that's a, that's um, directed at the, with the women in the, the live chat. But for me personally, um, my issue is expressing anger. It, it depends on the context and who is involved. Like, I'm very non-confrontational in one-on-one -on -one settings unless somebody else is, like, being hurt or... Um, like disrespected or something. If it's for someone else, like I'm there yelling at someone, you know? But if it's for me, a lot of the time I'm not, like in real life interpersonal situations. But online, <laughs> I'm very comfortable with my anger on the internet. Um, uh, Lisa Masel says, I think you're very diplomatic. That's why I'm enjoying your streams. Hidden gem in my opinion. Oh, thanks so much, Lisa. This is really like... <laughs> I don't know. When you women say this stuff to me, I'm just like very touched and I don't really know how to respond to it. Um, <laughs> Yogi, I don't know even know what you're replying to, but Yogi says, no, I'm 42. I'm out of fucks to get. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. I think I missed something in here that I didn't, I wanted to read. Clown World says, eh, there is such a thing as being too nice. I used to be like that. I still am to some degree. No, okay, so I think it's worth criticizing. You know, okay, for example, um, these gender critical women or radical, like, women who claim to be radical feminists who use preferred pronouns, who who missex trans people, it's it's worth it to say, you know, why are you doing that? Like, what what emotional mechanism has led to this outcome? Or, like, what thought process has led to this action, Right? But that's not necessarily to say, like, you're too nice, stop being nice. It's to analyze, like, why are you fulfilling your conditioning if you don't necessarily want to be, right? Um, and it shouldn't be an attack and it shouldn't be a shame. It should be I, always with this stuff, from my perspective, it should be a question. It should be a question why you think for yourself. Why is this happening this way? Why, is, why are you doing it this way? You, for yourself, should ask these questions. You don't need to satisfy me. It's not about me. It's for about you, you know? Anyway, that's how I kind of approach it. Um... <clears throat> Lisa says, I'm not going to change how I am because other women think I'm too nice. Yeah. It should be about you, what you want, what your values are, not about doing things for the women around you. Like, that's the thing, too, is when um when people are like, radical feminism is a cult. I'm like, no. <laughs> because I don't know. I, there have been very, very few instances I've seen of radical feminists who, like, do things and say things and act in certain ways because they think the women around them expect it from them. As far as I am, like, observing, radical feminism is very independently minded, or should be at least. Lisa says, um, sometimes anger can negatively impact yourself. Agreed. Pinwheel Art says, um, I express anger a lot, but in discussion, it's passion. Exactly. Um, a clown world says, being nice to men is siding with the oppressors against your sisters. When I realized that, I stopped being so coddling. We are so used to only thinking of men's perspective. Sad face. Yeah, exactly. It's really sad. Um, and also, not only is it sad, but it's like a lot of work, right? To to get yourself out of that conditioning, to to think of women first, to prioritize your sisters before you think of the scrotes. That's like a lot of work to to get to that place. Or to even get to the place of having an awareness of, oh, I just thought about men first. Let's stop right there. What's going on there? Even to get to that place, there's a lot of work. Um, 
like you guys probably noticed i i still am gender neutral a lot about a lot of things that i shouldn't be like i'll be like the people that i've dated well i've only dated women i'm only into women but i i still use like you see what i mean like it's conditioning and it's really difficult to get out of it um um a bird kill me says i agree benji for example i get bindle's argument for using words wrong sex pronouns but i don't agree with her logic but i understand it two different things yeah exactly um Anung says, how can we be a cult if we don't agree on anything? Two feminists, five opinions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, Lisa says, I don't know. Oh, sorry. I don't like how I feel when I get angry. It makes me anxious. That doesn't mean that there aren't things to be angry about. And I don't deny anyone else's anger. Yeah. So you're just being self-aware. You're recognizing how does it affect you negatively or positively? And then how does that affect, like, influence your activism or your advocacy or whatever so if it makes you anxious obviously it's not productive for you so i think it's good that you're self-aware and you're taking care of yourself yeah we don't need to be a monolith um yogi says i think i'm some kind of rad femme but i don't think label i don't like li labels and refuse to conform to groupthink yeah it's not supposed to be groupthink but yeah i get what you mean um i also like the labels thing i go back and forth on it sometimes i want to just call myself a feminist to be like look there's like a real feminism where women are centered but then it's like, and at the same, then I try and use, it's so stupid. Then I try and use the word radical feminist to differentiate myself, to kind of give people a bit of a signal like, oh, we're not going to agree on everything, you know? And then people don't know what radical feminism is. Okay. I have been on so many lesbian dating apps where my entire dating profile is like, I'm a radical feminist in this area. Do you want to hang out? Like swipe right or whatever. And so many of the women who reply will be like, yeah, I'm a radical feminist too. Like, and they're literally liberal feminists because they don't know what the word radical feminism is. They just think that they're like radical and cool and woke and that that's what radical. It's like, oh, my God. So it's kind of like, why am I even using the word? It's so stupid. Okay. Um, um, Beatrix video says people have different personalities. Being quiet or optimistic doesn't necessarily equate to submissiveness. That's a very good um, comment. Thank you. <laughs> Pop in some go nouns okay let's keep going through this a bit so i really love the metaphor of the birdcage which is on the cover of the book which is why i put it in the thing i love the metaphor of the birdcage it's, it's so perfect you know if you're looking so like abortion abortion is one thing that's like one one piece of wire from the cage all you look at is abortion you be like, well, this is just one in individual problem. You step back, you look at everything: women's um, financial stability, women's ability to like um, build their careers, um, women's financial responsibility over their children, all this kind of stuff. You look at it as a whole, then you understand abortion is not just abortion, right? Um, I, th I that's a really great metaphor. I really, really appreciated that metaphor from her. Um, is she the like initial person who did like the like the fem um gender is a cage thing? I'm not sure who started it because like I've heard obviously the concept, but um, I also like how she says it doesn't. She says um. Look, I'm paraphrasing here, but it doesn't matter how much time you spend focusing on it. If you only focus on one thing, you're not going to get the full perspective. And I think that really applies to a lot of liberal feminists. Um, because they think, you know, like I thought, well, I've been in feminism for so many years. I've read so many books. I've talked to so many women. I am I know what feminism is. But it's like, maybe not. Maybe you were spend a lot of time in work, but what you were studying was very myopic. So maybe you don't really have the full... The full um, Oh, okay, Anung says, yes, Marilyn owns the birdcage metaphor. Okay, cool. The door opening pretends to be a helpful service, but the helpfulness is false. This can be seen by noting that it will be done whether or not it makes any practical sense. Infirm men and men burdened with packages will open doors for able-bodied women who are free of physical burdens. Men will impose themselves awkwardly and jostle everyone in order to get to the door first. The act is not determined by convenience or grace. 
Furthermore, the very numerous acts of unneeded or even noisome quote-unquote help occur in counterpoint to the pattern of men not being helpful in many practical ways in which women might become helpful. Okay, so like, wait, well, it might welcome help. Okay, so... <clears throat> Oh, interesting. Beatrix video says it was Wollstonecraft who first wrote about the birdcage. I haven't read any first wave feminist literature. And I definitely should at some point. But, um, okay. <clears throat> so to me, it's like the door opening thing. It's like a metaphor for a lot of different stuff. But, like, even the door opening thing, it's like... I'm sure women that you've been in this situation... Like, I, I look so dykey now. This doesn't happen to me anymore. <laughs> But when I was, like, a kid, this happened to me. You know, like, so a guy runs up to open the door. And as a response, you actually have to, like, stop, wait for them to get to the door, wait for them to open the door, and then go through the door. So it's actually slowed you down. And it's, like, fucking awkward and weird. And it's, like, in this guy's head, he just did something helpful. He was chivalrous, right? In my head, I had to wait and stop for this fucking guy who's fluffing his ego. Oh, Anung says the guilt cage quote is very different from the bird cage metaphor. Okay. Maybe I should make a video about that. Oh, Beatrix says, I think Marilyn is paying tribute to her by writing with the metaphor. Interesting. Okay, cool, cool. Um, Yeah, so I don't know. I just, I love all the metaphors in here or whatever. The way that she explains things is great. Is that a metaphor? Yeah, it's a metaphor. I also, <laughs> I was thinking the other day, what did my English teacher think? I had this like gay guy English teacher. And I literally would not have graduated high school without him. Like, I literally, I was like, going to drop out of high school. And he was like, come to the library and write all of the English exams for the grade 12 books. Because I know you've read those books. And then I will, I, he sat beside me and was marking the exams as I was doing the next one. So I sat there and did like four grade 12 English exams while he sat down next to me marking. As he was marking, he was like, stop. After I finished, he was like, stop writing. After I'm finished marking this, you are at a 60% in the course. Once I finish marking what you finished on that essay, you will have passed the course. He is the reason I graduated high school. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I was like very fucked in the head as a teenager. <laughs> like I was really, really mentally unwell. Um, but I really wonder what would he think if he knew this is what I do. My YouTube channel is me reading books and basically doing like a book report. <laughs> like, <laughs> Okay. Um, I hope he'd be proud of me. <laughs> okay. So, um, the gallant gestures have no practical meaning. The meaning is symbolic. Yeah, it's about fluffing their fucking egos. Yogi says that's a good teacher. No, he was a fucking godsend. I literally would have not graduated high school without him. Um, hey, listen to this. This reminds me of, oh, thank you so much, Hugo, for your book fund. Um. Maybe when I'm done going through the essay, I'm pretty close. We can talk about which other books I should buy. Okay. It's from my list of like 40 books. <laughs> okay. Um, so listen to this. Listen to this. It reminds me a bit of the, the Dworkin, you know, that women don't want to become aware of the effects of patriarchy because it's so painful. Listen to this. It seems sometimes that people take a deliberately myopic view and fill their eyes with things seen microscopically in order to not see macroscopically. Exactly. So because the systemic oppression is so like awesome is so severe is is difficult to wrap your mind around it and really accept that this is the position that you're in it's much easier to focus on one little thing like this is what liberal feminists do right they focus on empowerment and if you focus on empowerment you don't need to think oh you know when women are sexually exploited that hurts them when women are encouraged to do uh, like bdsm that hurts them when women are encouraged to become hypersexual at young ages, that hurts them. You don't need to think about all these things. because All you need to think about is empowerment. So, um, I, yes, I, I found this quote um, quite poignant. Um, Ella says afternoon. Hello, Ella. Oh, I guess it is afternoon. It is 18 minutes after the noon. Um, Anang says, Michigan State used to place a heavy emphasis on Marxist analysis. That's probably where the birdcage analogy sprung from. Oh, very interesting. I actually haven't done, like, I was like a Tumblr Marxist, which means all I knew was, like, quotes I read on Tumblr. I don't know like a fuck ton about Marxism and at some point I do want to learn about it but I very intentionally decided I wanted to learn about second wave radical feminism separate from Marx before I learned about Marx. Okay. Um, happy Valentine's Day. Yes. Happy Galentine's Day women. Anybody watch Parks and Rec? <laughs> uh, like Leslie and Anne and like their BFF like friendship goals. 
Leslie and Anne definitely exist somewhere on Adrian Rich's lesbian continuum. Like, that's a good friendship. Um, um, Beatrix says, Anung, you're definitely more knowledgeable than me. If you don't already do any radical feminist teaching, you should consider it with a smiley face. Um, or if you want to be interviewed on my channel, like, even because part of what I want to capture on my channel is not necessarily like theory, but also just history, you know, like if you hung out with these professors and at that university and you knew like the young rad femmes and stuff like that would be something worth talking about. Um, And also like um, I want to encourage a lot of women who might not necessarily want to be interviewed to be interviewed and use like you don't need to use your face and we can use a voice disorder and use like a, a pseudonym that I feel like there's so much history that is being lost and we need to record it in some way anyway anung says a lot of radical feminism came from women at michigan state some from u of m too but more from michigan state yeah like isn't that kind of why mishfest ended up in that place and why like there was multiple lesbian and feminist magazines being printed in michigan around the same era yeah they were just all concentrated there um <clears throat> Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um <laughs> Okay, am I allowed to say N G R O E S? Am I allowed to say that? Cuz like isn't that kind of like the N word light? I don't think I should say that, right? I didn't say it when I read it, but if it comes up again, I'm not like, what am I supposed to do with that? I'm not quite sure. Okay. Um, yeah. So then she talks about like groups that are oppressed and how you have to be a part of that group to be oppressed. Um, and it's like refreshing to me that it's so straightforward to her when nowadays, like being a part of an oppressed group is like a whole like fucking song and dance of bullshit. Um, Hugo is like LMAO Tumblrinas don't know shit all about Marxism. Yeah, I know that. That's why I'm like, I need to eventually actually read Marx, but like eventually. Um, Anang says, I came out of retirement to work with young Native women. I used to teach special ed. I need to place all my energies in preserving Native cultures and destroying the lies of the New Age slash trans cult. Yes, I got to meet and talk with all the big names because I lived in East Lansing and Ann Arbor. Wow, that's really cool. Um, and yeah, I hope you don't feel that I am like um, pressuring you or shaming you or anything. Like, you clearly have your priorities, and like, you know, good for you. I support you. Um, uh, Bird Kilney said, Women's International Decoration does a cool feminist seminar every Sunday, and they have women analyzing radical feminist texts. Yes, that's true. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, WDI, the YouTube channel, has a lot of really great stuff. Um, they recently did um, like a reading and analysis of the Scum Manifesto by um, Valerie Salonas. I haven't watched that, but I downloaded it to watch it later. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Uh, Hugo Savage uh, says, uh, Leslie and Anne in Parks and Rec reference to Amy Poehler and Tina Fey. Yeah. And do you guys know that, um, oh my god, what's her name, what's her name, what's her name, what's her name? The woman who plays Anne. How did I forget her name? Well, whatever. The woman who plays Anne in Parks and Rec, she is, like, kind of radical feminist. She talks about, like, sex trafficking and sexual exploitation and, like, she doesn't use these words exactly, but how, like, sex positivity is, like, harmful to young girls these days. Um, she's really cool. Okay, let's keep going. Oh, wow, Anung. That is quite extreme. Wow. <laughs> um, Anung, oh, Anung. Okay, Anung says, I have traveled all over the U.S. and Canada, and I have never, ever met a native who had a quote-unquote two-spirit tradition. That bullshit came from burdock theory in settler um, anthropology. Yeah. Um, I actually find that interesting. So there are some, um, I wouldn't say radical feminists, but radical women, maybe. Um, who I would like to have on the channel, who call themselves Two-Spirit. Um, 
And I really wonder what that means to them and why they've chosen that label. Um, because what you just described is that's how I understand Two-Spirit. And my only observation of the term Two-Spirit is like the young woke crowd, often not even indigenous at all, using the term Two-Spirit because they think it's like an edgier way to be queer. Um, yeah. <laughs> what? A bird killed me says, didn't the actress who played Anne have a beef with Tupac? So random. Really? That's was bizarre. Um Beatrix says the panel on Salonis was my favorite so far. Watching all the panelists um, snickering about turd sessions made my day. <laughs> um, Anang Ikwe says, Will Roscoe, a homosexual pedophile, coined the term two-spirit. His agenda was to legitimize pedophilia. Oh, fuck. I mean, of course, of course. Every fucking bullshit in the queer theory crap in the postmodern woke shit every fucking thing leads back to pedophilia anong says our language our ceremonies everything is separated by biological sex women don't even say hello yes or no in the same way that men do the two-spirit concept is laughable yeah so like um when i was reading this book I'm not claiming that i'm super knowledgeable about this or whatever but I'm just saying, from my very basic understanding of things, it seems the term two-spirit is, like, a problem. Because, so, from this book, there's, um, there's, they discuss um, Anishinaabe, Mojave, and, um, oh, fuck, Cree, I think, that they discuss three different, um, <clears throat> tribes and their like special gender categories and each of them had like a different name a different role a different like and so to me it's like and then later on in this book the author uses the term two-spirit i'm like so you've basically like flattened all the differences and put it into one stupid category what that is like cultural erasure or something like according to the wokesters wouldn't they consider that like a bad in a, some way like i just it's so fucking like incomprehensible to me um um Ella says it's all about pedophilia, all subversion is to get to the children. Um, well, a lot of it, yeah. Anung says there are some natives who do not know their language and their culture who use the term two spirit. That's why I went back to teaching to fight that propaganda. That's wow. I don't, I don't even know what to say because, like, who am I to be like, I support you, but I support you. <laughs> um, Frau Fantastic says there's more to life than books, you know. There's there, but not much more, not much more. Morrissey slash the Smiths. <laughs> I fucking love books, man. Um, Pinwheel says, okay, no, I'm just going to read all of Anung's stuff and then I'll read the other people. Okay, Anung says, if you speak an indigenous language, you know how absurd and negative the transliteration of two spirit is. Not every native knows their culture, sadly. Um, when natives don't know their culture, they turn to the new age and the woke liberals to fill the gaps. This is how our culture gets polluted. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for speaking about it on here. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and yeah, it's really sad. Like, the women I know who use it, or the one woman that I'm aware of who uses it, who is kind of radical, was, I think she was the longest serving prisoner in Canada. Like, she was in prison for, like, since the 70s. And she got out, like, a few years ago. And so to me, it's like, I mean, okay, I don't know that much about prisons and women's prisons in Canada, but, you know, on a very basic level, being in, like, a governmental institution definitely cuts you off from your culture, even if there's other Native women inside. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I don't know. Just what you're saying made me think of that. Um, okay. So, um, okay, Anang says, Natives don't correct the use of the term two-spirit because it identifies the speaker as an outsider then we know which protocols to observe with that individual. Oh, that's very interesting. <clears throat> oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, so it has a practical usage. But that's very sad that there's like outsiders within your own culture. Like that's that's depressing. Um, yeah. A bird killed me says, I know one thing about women's prisons in Canada, they're mixed sex. Rashida Jones, that is the name. I fucking love her. Everyone Google Rashida Jones. She's great. Follow her on Twitter or something. I love her. Okay. Um, Pinwheel Art says, there is a book on PR herbalism and two spirit, it used to describe espiritas. They are healers connected to the two aspects of the universe in a nutshell. Okay, interesting. Um, Aquarius says that's why you need to see that Derek Jensen 
he points the big five philosophy QT pedos in under six minutes. Oh, okay. I get it now. Hugo says, Trudens hate Marxist Leninism and countries like China and Russia. If you get into ML, um, you'll tangibly have a new way to upset Trudens. <laughs> oh, tangentially have a new way to upset Trudens. Okay. Um, Anung says, the church, the government, and the new age have been bastardizing our culture for years and years. It's a struggle that distracts us from our real land issues. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Oh, it's already 1230. I don't know if I have time to read another chapter of this today. Actually, I might do it in the evening. Because I have a Zoom at... What's 1700 UK? That's... 2 p.m. Wait, no. 1700 is 5 p.m., which is noon for me. Wait, what? Fuck. I'm supposed to have a Zoom at 1700 UK. What time is that right now? Oh my fucking god. I thought it was in two hours and it's right now. I'm fucking... Oh my god. Okay. I have to end this stream. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. Um, I will probably stream again later today. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. <laughs> See you later. Bye.